now that the easy lecture is over, we can start. <laughs> you think I'm joking? <laughs> Actually, you don't. That's right. You don't. Um, no, we're, we're going to dive into kind of. It turns out this is. I don't want you to feel intimidated by this. It's like you're at a magic convention. I really mean it. It's like you're at a magic convention and I'm up here doing magic tricks or whatever, except I'm not. I'm actually explaining the magic trick. So I have to show you the magic trick, then I explain the magic trick, and you still, like, your fingers aren't coordinated enough to, like, flip the card over or whatever. And it's actually, I'm not, it's much simpler than it seems. You just stick with it a little bit and you can understand it. It's not profound. These guys came up with a series of little tricks if you read their books, all their books are the same book, just over and over and over again. Um, the hard part is that they use lots of mysterious language, and I'm gonna to try to help you see through the mysterious language. And the good news is that if this is quick and overwhelming and a lot of information, there are videos being made. And then you can watch those when we put them out not too long from now. And if you really wanna go granular with it, by the way, I also have a, don't die. I also have a series of podcasts that um, explore Paulo Freire, and I actually more or less literally read these books out loud to a microphone, and you can listen to his own words in tremendous depth. Uh, so don't feel like you're missing something that you can't recover. I could package up my notes and make them available. And I'm also finishing up a book on precisely this subject, not specifically the last lecture, but most of this one and the one we start with tomorrow, the two in the middle. And so that'll be available hopefully by the end of the month, next month. And so this is all coming, don't sweat, but I'm gonna help you see through the magic trick. And this episode of Decoding Marxist Magic is about Paulo Freire and the Marxification of education. So we're gonna talk all about Paulo. It's a little weird, I had to like kind of flip a coin between whether I wanted to do this one first or the critical turn in education first. And it's kind of like neither one of them fully makes sense without the other. So that's more encouragement to watch videos later when they come out so you can kind of see them back to back. All this stuff, what I've learned, and so I'll share this with you, about studying Marxism is that it never makes sense the first time. It usually doesn't make sense until you've actually seen a few different pieces, and then you see them in light of each other, and then it all is like, oh, that's all it is? And so, bear with it. This will be an interesting lecture. If you are not familiar with Paulo Freire um, and what he did and what Marxifying education looks like, uh, Prepare to be shocked. Prepare to be appalled. Prepare to be like rolling your eyes like, really? That's it? Um, so what I want to frame this out is, so we just talked about the theft of education. I want to frame this in terms of it being a Marxist religious revival, which is weird since we're talking about education in a liberal, secular country, right? That has a First Amendment that says the state isn't going to propose any kind of religious instruction, say, through its state-run schools. And I need you to understand that what Karl Marx created was not, again, get it into your head, he did not create a social theory, he did not create an economic theory, I would argue he did not create a philosophy, he created a theology, he created a man-centered religion, and you can make whatever ties to uh, deceivers or enemies or lucifers or satans that you want to believe that that might represent, and I don't think I would argue with you. The thing is, like we talked about, because of the the problems that faced Marxism leading into cultural Marxism, the problems that faced cultural Marxism that forced the development of critical Marxism, the problem of reproduction that the critical Marxists were just ramming their heads against the wall to try to get past, the idea that the society just keeps reproducing itself and it just, you can't get around it, that needed a solution and that also was very frustrating. So Marxism was really kind of on the ropes by the time we get to about 1970, 1975 range. There were lots of Marxists, they were doing lots of Marxist analysis, but they were not very spirited anymore. They were not very positive anymore. Postmodernism was on the ascendant. Postmodernists often say that they were post-Marxist. They had kind of given up on Marxism too. I don't think that they had in essence, but they weren't particularly, uh, if you read their criticisms, they criticize the West, they criticize uh, capitalism, they criticize liberalism, but they criticize Marxism as well. They criticize um, communism and says it, saying that it just doesn't work. And so the, there's this kind of despair in the mood. And Paulo Freire comes along, and I think the best way to think of him is as a religious revivalist. I didn't realize, when I was reading through the politics of education, and I was starting to do a podcast series, and you guys can go back and listen if you go to the New Discourses 
uh, website or the New Discourses podcast, and you, if you need to spell it, it's behind me, and you can, uh, <laughs> James Lindsay, newdiscourses.com, great to meet you. Um, you can go to the website and uh, you can look, listen to the early podcasts in the Critical Education series, and when I started to go through Paulo Freire's book, The Politics of Education, and I'm still reading the introduction by Henry Drew, and what happened was I literally had to stop after one, and I said I cannot continue talking about education until I talk about Marxism as a theology. And so I took an entire sidebar, did a series of podcasts about the uh, theology of Marxism, created an entire workshop series I did in June about the theology of Marxism, because it's not possible to understand what happened to education without understanding that it got transformed into a Sunday school for a religion that you don't even know how it works, uh, that is the religion of Marxism, which our Supreme Court has made the tremendous error over the decades that it's had the opportunity to classify it as a religion, and it missed that opportunity every single time, which I hope we can change, because it would have a tremendous effect. Turns out to be hard to seize the means of production of a state if you're not allowed to do it through the state because of the First Amendment. Um, so I want you to think of Paulo Freire as a religious revivalist who figured out how to be hopeful and utopian and visionary and to re-enthuse uh, an entire new generation of Marxists. And that enthuse, uh, enthusiasm that he inspired uh, comes from the fact that his method sidesteps the problem of reproduction by stealing education to do it. So my little blurb I wrote so I can be concise and give you the story is that the means of the theft of education is the Marxification of education, which was largely accomplished through the adoption of Paulo Freire's methods. So the key thing is your kids go to Paulo Freire's schools. Everything, not quite everything, but almost everything going wrong in the schools is because your kids go to Paulo Freire schools. And if you don't know who Paulo Freire is, you don't know what's going on in your kids' schools. And you can't do anything to fix it. You don't know how to deprogram them, you don't know how to protect them, you don't know how to challenge it, you don't know how to get it out of the schools, you can't even recognize what it is. And what his method is, is the so-called pedagogy of the oppressed. So we'll be careful, pedagogy means a theory of education. It's gonna to have to come up a lot because it's what we're really talking about. Critical pedagogy was what we talked about in the critical turn. It's a theory of education. The pedagogy of the oppressed is a theory of education that's designed to educate you, if you will, and I put that, I use that term very, very loosely, into seeing the world from the perspective of the oppressed. No longer to see the world in terms of how it is, but rather to see it from the uh, existential experience of somebody who experiences oppression, the so-called lived experience of oppression. Freire's method is focused on something he calls generative themes. He thinks that education's not engaging enough without coming at it through what he calls generative themes. If you end up reading educational documents, you're going to see the word generative all over the place, especially curriculum documents. Not the curricula themselves, but say, if you look into an academic paper justifying why the curriculum, say, includes a drag queen, you'll find that literally the academic papers justifying drag queen story hour say that it is a generative educational prospect. Literally, they use the word generative because that's the goal. And so that's the magic trick. That's how education is stolen. I said that in the last lecture too, is the switch to the generative themes approach enables the theft of education. And that's what we're gonna cover how that happens. So generative themes are the basis for Friday's educational engagement, and it enables any subject, academic or otherwise, it could be football coaching at the school, any subject, academic or otherwise, to be retooled to raise critical consciousness and create activists instead of covering the subject material. But it does so while retaining enough of its external form to slip under the radar. And so when you show up to complain about it at the school board or with the superintendent or the principal or with the teacher, they say every time, it's just this, it's just that. And the whatever they say it just is, which by the way, every time that word just comes out, it's probably a lie, trust your senses, is something completely reasonable. And it's super hard to argue against that particular thing. And then they'll write stories about you in the newspaper. I know we got the Middle Tennessee people in, in the house over here saying that, well, they wanna ban these Holocaust books or whatever. They wanna ban books. Because it turns out that what they're doing with the, these, the materials themselves are sometimes objectionable, especially these sexual books. Um, but a lot of times the books or the materials are not necessarily objectionable and it's what they're doing with it and how they're using it that is objectionable. And that is the Frarian theft of education trick. So Freire's work has to be seen, like I said, as a Marxist religious revival though, because his goal is to actually transform schools into religious instruction or thought reform uh, programs to get around the problem of reproduction. 
and that actually requires Marxifying education, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Before, or tonight, I guess, before we go any further, I want to point out virtually, not all, not all, but virtually every fad that you've seen in education that you're appalled by, the big one that I don't think is directly connected to Paulo Freire is Common Core, uh, but virtually every other massive fad in education traces back to Freire or is partially or totally justified on the back of Paulo Freire or has direct linkages, although it may not be directly derived from Paulo Freire. In the last lecture, we talked about culturally relevant pedagogy or culturally relevant teaching, you know, the other CRT. Um, that is just a direct repackaging of Paulo Freire's methods. And when we go through this, if you're familiar with culturally relevant teaching, it'll be very obvious that that's what it is. Social emotional learning, especially in its new incarnation, which we'll talk about in the fourth lecture tomorrow afternoon, which is transformative social emotional learning, is the contemporary kind of psychosociological application of Freire's method in our schools using psychology and sociology and at risk status of children in order to justify doing transformative or consciousness raising methods with the kids. So social emotional learning has deep roots. I don't wanna say that somebody read Paulo Freire and came up with this. It actually predates Freire as its own genealogy, but it's massively been infused with Freudian pedagogy. Restorative justice, which is why your kids are in schools that are dangerous. It is in the restorative justice and the inclusive classroom are a kind of modernized extension. Again, somewhat different genealogy as well, but it's also an extension of his so-called dialogical or democratic classroom. You can't exclude anybody. You can't have a, pro a program where there's any kind of power dynamic. And of course, that means you can't have discipline. Um, that's other, it has another genealogical route, which is to um, close off the so-called school to prison pipeline. So that's a separate thing. But again, the dialogical method that, that Freire it means to use dialogue between the people in the classroom as equals uh, and the inclusive classroom have roots in this kind of democratic dialogical classroom that Freire said is necessary to overcome the reproduction of power dynamics through school. You know, the teacher being like in a position of authority and the students being uh, expected to be quiet and listen and learn and whatever else and take direction, et cetera, from the instructor. That power dynamic reproduces hierarchy, reproduces oppression, and therefore has to be gotten rid of. Obviously, a discipline-free classroom kind of falls into that. This is that's not a huge stretch. They're connected. I'm not saying that Paulo Freire is the source of restorative justice. I want to be clear about that. The project-based learning environments where they're, instead of teaching kids, they're making them do like uh, community service projects or working on things in groups and teaching each other. Again, not wholly Freire, but a lot of the stuff that came out of Paulo Freire was to actually have peer-to-peer -peer learning where everybody's equals. Teachers and students are kind of equivalent. He in fact said that you have to overcome the idea of teacher and student. He says this in the pedagogy of the oppressed to have what he calls, he just hyphenates them, teacher students and student teachers who are on some level equals. And so one of the things he actually suggests is that other students uh, facilitate in the learning. Um, and we'll see, in fact, in the next lecture that we see similar stuff in Maoist thought reform prisons in communist China uh, back in the, say, 1950s. Decolonizing the curriculum, we already mentioned in the previous lecture, Paulo Freire was first a post-colonialist. And so the idea of decolonizing the curriculum is to take out curricular elements that uh, uphold or that are central to um, having a common culture to the previous culture, to, to provide that continuity of culture, and replacing it with materials that are likely to be, in most cases, generative one way or another. Uh, and the goal is to use the generative themes method, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, to uh, stimulate conversations in order to conscientize and radicalize students. And lastly, um, I already mentioned uh, the, the drag queen, so you get the punchline. Comprehensive sexuality education is not mostly derived off of Paulo Freire. I didn't read anything in Paulo Freire that explicitly points in the direction of sexuality at all, uh, or sexual liberation at all. Whether he's into that or not, it's not apparent in his major writings. Um, it's unlikely, in my opinion, that he was into that line. That's other people. Marcusa definitely was into it. Wilhelm Reich was into it. John Money is another name that's really weirdo in that. The United Nations, for some reason, is really, really into it. But like I said, a lot of the things that you see under comprehensive sexuality education are justified as being generative approaches. So the Frarian method got brought into the sexuality and gender education 
that they're doing. And the method by which they're doing it is to, again, create generative context, generative situations to have the dialogue. So I'm gonna say the word generative in this lecture like 300,000 times because it is the key word of this lecture. It is the key word of the magic trick. And you have to understand that when you see the word generative in an education or a curriculum document, what it means is that they're using it to take out educational content and insert political content um, one way or another. It is the key word in understanding what Paulo Freire did. Everything else is nuts and bolts or religious transformation, which we're gonna spend the back half of the lecture talking about. So the Iron Law of Oak Projection, as we all know, I say this all the time, I heard it on TV the other day, so I know it's getting out there. Uh, somebody on the news actually said, they got asked a question and answered, well, the Iron Law of Oak Projection never misses. <laughs> and it never misses, so it's here. We're talking about this being the theft of education, and the Iron Law of Oak Projection is actually appearing in the theft of education. Paulo Freire's general case for what he's doing overall is that by teaching people boring things like disconnected syllables in his literacy classes, he was mostly teaching reading, by the way, so everything that he actually taught was about literacy and reading. We can extend that to other subjects like math, science, and history, and so on. But he talked specifically about literacy training virtually only. Uh, but um, he said that when you focus on teaching people, say, to sound out words, that that's boring and disconnected. So in a sense, he didn't say explicitly, but you're stealing the educational opportunity from them. Because the real educational opportunity is to be politically educated. He's very explicit about that in chapter after chapter after chapter. A real education is a political education where you learn to see the political context of your real concrete conditions, especially if you're oppressed. His program is literally called the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is to use the idea of oppression in order to conscientize the oppressed to the Marxist analysis of their circumstances. And so academic education for Paulo Freire is a waste of time. It's the thing you point to as the sales pitch in order to do it. Disconnected syllables, sounding words out, stupid sentences like see Dick run, see Jane run, see Dick and Jane run. That doesn't mean anything to anybody. That's boring. Instead, you want to use generative concepts. And so really, people are already having education stolen from them by it not being a political education. It's a false education. He doesn't say stolen, he doesn't, he doesn't just imply. He says that it's actually a false education and they're missing the opportunity for a real education. And so from a Marxist perspective, he believes that education's already being stolen from people because it reproduces the society and thus steals the opportunity for liberation away from them. Steals, in fact, as we'll talk about, their ability to know themselves as people who can know and thus alienates themselves from themselves in exactly the same way that Marx says the division of labor alienates people. Um, so that's why I'm going to call this the Marxification of education with Paulo Freire because what Paulo Freire does is turns, it, it turns education itself into a Marxist theory. It's not that he puts Marxism into education, he turns it into a Marxist theory itself. So the guts then of the theft of education that we discussed in the last lecture, the critical turn of education, um, is that you should be teaching, teaching in scare quotes, political literacy, as he calls it, in place of actual literacy. And actual literacy will follow because when you become politically literate, you will want to become actually literate so you can learn more about your context. Then you'll be motivated to learn, then you will learn. That's the claim that he makes, as a matter of fact. The purpose, he says, for teaching for uh, the oppressed or teaching for political literacy or teaching for liberation or teaching for humanization. He has lots of different phrases for how he puts it. They all mean the same thing. It means teaching Marxism is, and I quote, to make the learners want to engage in a perpetual cultural revolution. The goal of a Ferrarian education is to make learners ready to engage in cultural revolution. Not any cultural revolution, but one that never stops. The second that society is overthrown, it's already a new society that has to be overthrown again. Perpetual cultural revolution is the goal, explicitly stated. As a matter of fact, he holds up kind of two emblems in the politics of education of what an ideal educational uh, avatar or cultural revolutionary uh, representative looks like for education. These are the role models for your kids. They are Che Guevara and the Chinese Cultural Revolution. While he was writing this book, 
We're talking about just a couple of years before the Tiananmen Square Massacre. While he was writing the essays that formed this book, we're talking about Mao murdering people by the tens of millions. And he's holding this up as the avatar of an ideal cultural revolution that doesn't get caught up in its own old, in its own like uh, vision and its old forms and become stagnant and bureaucratic like the Soviets. No kidding. But Che Guevara is the epitome of what you should be trying to inspire your children to become like. This is in the seventh chapter, particularly of politics of education. He just says that his particular guerrilla style witness, as he phrases it, is not the witness that everybody has to take up. But that would be lots of murder um, that he's actually pointing to as an ideal. In the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he actually complains that Fidel Castro wasn't kind of like steely nerved enough and Che Guevara is a much better emblem of what you should be aspiring to. So he quotes and cites these guys, by the way, but he almost never talks about a single education theorist in any of his writing. And we transformed our entire education system around him for some reason. No, the reason is because Marxists wanted it. How does this work? How do you have your perpetual cultural revolution? How is it that as soon as the new society comes into being after you get your revolution, you're supposed to do it again? His method is entirely what Marcuse called negative thinking. Herbert Marcuse, the leading critical Marxist of the 60s, so the negative thinking will become positive. He says that what you're gonna do is you're going to tear down the existing society so that the ideal society contained within it can emerge. And Paulo Freire says what we're going to do is we're going to adopt a critical consciousness and then we're going to engage in a process of denunciation and enunciation. So you're going to denounce the existing society and if you do that from a Marxist perspective, then you automatically announce a better possibility. Automatically, you don't actually announce what the better possibility is. He actually says that if you do that, that's right wing and not acceptable. So when I did a podcast called Communism Doesn't Know How, I didn't even know about this yet. I didn't realize that it's actually communism isn't allowed to know how. If they assert a vision, Paulo Freire says, of what the future should look like, they will try to impose it on people and that's intrinsically right wing. So all you do is continually denounce all that exists over and over and over again and apparently like a pot of gold or the tree of life or the utopia grows out of the ashes. That's literally the vision that he wants education to teach children. That's the society he wants your children to, to create for themselves. I shouldn't say that because he was teaching adult literacy. That's the society that the, his disciples wanted your children to pick up because they did want to teach children explicitly. Like I said, this requires critical consciousness or what, what I would call reading his work utopian consciousness, which is an extension of that. We'll talk about it in the next lecture tomorrow or earlier in the afternoon. Um, which is only possible if you've been conscientized, if you've been brainwashed into believing that this is the way to advance in the world. Not knowing what you actually want to see in the world and doing things, but rather just tearing down everything you don't like constantly. So who was this lunatic, this cult leader, this guru, Paulo Freire? He was born in Recife, Brazil. Actually, no, he was, I don't know exactly where he was born. I don't care that much about his biography. He lived in Recife, Brazil at some point significantly in his life. This is uh, where he did most of his early studying, his post-colonial studying. He was a angry individual due to the fact that he was in a middle-class family, was dispossessed by the government taking over and his family losing their wealth. And he apparently, there's really, I mean, it's a genuinely tragic story. After this revolution in Brazil, he's eating out of garbage dumps and things like this. It's really just really bad. And this radicalized him into saying that the colonialists and the outside influences coming in and taking over nations is really bad. And so he wants to uh, educate the peasants to not be trapped in this new world. Um, he wrote a number of books, lots of them in fact, I think many of them are just collections of his essays. I have not read all of them. Uh, I don't think it matters because as far as I can tell, they're all the same book. Um, the three most important would be Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which he published in English in 1970. Uh, the Politics of Education, which is a edited collection of essays that came out in 85 and made him the mainstay of education. And then he has a book in 1992, 1992 called The Pedagogy of Hope. And this is mostly a biography of him with some more of his crackpot thinking. And from what I can tell, it's just the same book over and over and over again. Um, he did a PhD thesis, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, in phenomenology. Phenomenology, this is a long diversion that we're not gonna get into, but if you want to go back to it, Phenomenology of Spirit was uh, Georg Hegel's 1807 book 
uh, is the one that outlines the so-called dialectical project or trajectory for leftism. And Karl Marx picked it up and turned it into dialectical materialism. Phenomenology is, uh, I'm trying to understand the that which you see in the world as it is as a phenomenon. What it actually boils down to though in, in understanding what it means is the interpretation of reality is what reality really is. Your perception of reality is what the word reality means. So this is where lived experience becomes primary. This is where other ways of knowing become central. And this is very important to understanding how he thought about the world because he's very interested or concerned about the problem of the excluded knower. He doesn't phrase it that way. Later theorists phrase it that way. Like I said, he got kicked out of Brazil. He has, actually, it's a very interesting story. He came up with this pedagogy program where he teaches people to read through his generative methods. Allegedly, I don't know if it's true or not, but allegedly, he ended up getting a number of peasants to go from zero to fully literate in some record amount of time, like 45 days. The Brazilian government was enthralled with what he had achieved, tried to make a national program out of it, and then there was a revolution, and they were like, you're a communist or something, get out. And he fled to Bolivia. They shut down his program, he fled to Bolivia. They had a revolution literally uh, three weeks later, and he fled again. I don't know if he was kicked out or if he just fled, and he went to Chile uh, and stayed there for a number of years and studied Marxism relentlessly, largely with priests, uh, liberation theologians. Uh, Catholics, I should say Marxists posing as Catholics. And um, those are the main ideas then that inform him, post-colonial theory, the idea that the colonization has to be rebuked, if, including possibly by violence in for order for people to understand who they are and to reclaim a sense of self that's deeply informed by Marxist thinking. A PhD in phenomenology, so you're very interested in the experience, uh, your, your, uh, your perception of reality being that which reality actually is. There is no necessarily reality out there, and we're gonna understand things in terms of how they are phenomena that unfold that's gonna tie back into Marx, like I said, through the idea of the Hegelian phenomenology of spirit. Then he latches into Marxism directly, and he gets raised in a profoundly leftist heresy of Catholicism called liberation theology, which holds up uh, duty to the poor in kind of a very, Mar well, not kind of, an explicitly very Marxist way as its uh, primary theological agenda. And as a matter of fact, this was a communist project to infect the communist or the Catholic Church because they realized the Catholic Church was one of its primary enemies and obstacles in the world. So they had to figure out how to undermine it from within. So that's who this guy is. Um, little other bio things that might be worth hearing. He writes this Pedagogy of the Press in 68. He ends up on some kind of a minor invitation. He ends up getting brought up to uh, New York City. He gets brought to the United States. Harvard takes an interest in him, offers him a, uh, actually I think it's 67 he came to the US for the first time, offers him a uh, two year lecturing appointment at Harvard. Uh, but at the same time, he's offered a appointment at the World Council of Churches in Geneva and he wants to take both of them. So he lectures at Harvard for six months, writes a couple papers for Harvard Educational Review, sweeps off to Europe, goes to Geneva to work with the World Council of Churches, which is a big ecumenical, probably communist front project to uh, water down faith and turn it into an interfaith project, and works there for 10 years before he ends up coming back to the US, before he can start going back to places like Brazil after quite a long time in his uh, exile. He wasn't popular in the United States, like I said in the previous lecture, until after 1985 when Henry Giroux popularized him um, after relentless praxis. His method ultimately is what he calls a pedagogy of the oppressed, which is to get you to see from the standpoint of the oppressed. I'm going to drill that language into you, standpoint of the oppressed, standpoint of the oppressed, or the oppressed standpoint. And there's a reason for that that I will unveil for you like a magician later tomorrow. What he actually is looking at is he's saying that the schools in, that he's looking at, the, the, the method of education is false. He says that it engages in, uh, he's created the straw man of it that's kind of a straw man of the Prussian model where we all sit in lines and we all take instruction and I'm supposed to make you into good citizens or whatever as a teacher. Uh, he creates a straw man of it called the banking model of education. This is, he's quite famous for the banking model of education. What that is is that the students are like empty receptacles, they're like bank deposit boxes. And I, as the teacher, or whoever the teacher is, is going to deposit knowledge into the empty receptacle, 
like it's a bank deposit box, and then the student, it's up to them whether or not, and this is how he phrases it, whether or not they want to capitalize on the deposit made into their box. So they're not seen as people who know things, they are seen as completely ignorant people who are there to receive the wisdom from on high from the teacher as though the teacher is depositing money into a bank account. Uh, and he literally called it the banking model of education and he proposes a dialogical model, which sounds really complicated, except that it means dialogue-based, discussion-based model of education to replace it. We should talk as equals rather than me being somebody who's depositing knowledge into your head. We'll just have a discussion the whole time and that's going to facilitate uh, a more egalitarian or democratic classroom where we're not reproducing power dynamics. I'm not assuming you don't know anything. I'm not teaching you to assume you don't know anything. I'm not holding myself up as an expert or an avatar of knowledge, something outside of you, something holding you back maybe from your own knowledge. Well, here's how he describes it in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. In the banking concept of education, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. I told you, full blast, didn't exaggerate. I didn't straw man him, he just straw mans education. It is a, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. I don't know how many educators we have in the room. They have, I bet you zero of you have ever believed that your students know nothing. Even I taught math and I knew my students knew things, just not a lot of math. <laughs> Which was true at the end of the year too, I mean. <laughs> Projecting an absolute ignorance onto others, a characteristic of the ideology of oppression, this negates education and knowledge as a process of inquiry. So now the students aren't looking to learn, they're not interested in learning, it's just a process they have to go through. The teacher presents himself to his students as their necessary opposite, so now he gets weird. By considering their ignorance absolute, he justifies his own existence. Any teachers you know like that, that you've ever known like that? Like maybe that one really bad professor you had one time that was a total jerk, and probably not even then. The students, alienated like the slave in the Hegelian dialectic, accept their ignorance as justifying the teacher's existence. But unlike the slave, they never discover that they educate the teacher. So you know that cutesy phrase, I learn as much from my students as they learn from me, which is obvious BS. There, there we go. There it is in like formal Marxist language. So this is his actual vision of what he's conquering in education. He, this is why he thinks that education is being stolen from students or learners. He doesn't like to call them students. You see, you as the learner are the narcissistic supply of the teacher who justifies his own existence as somebody who knows a lot more than you idiots, you plebs, you students. You justify my existence. And now we go back to Drag Queen Story Hour for a second. And I, it sounds like I'm making a joke because of the obvious narcissism of the drag queen, except that if you read the paper Drag Pedagogy that was published in Curriculum Inquiry last year, where they explain why Drag Queen Story Hour is a thing, written by one of the actual uh, drag queens in Drag Queen Story Hour by the stage name of Lil Miss Hot Mess. I kid you not. <laughs> Cur Curriculum Inquiry is one of the most famous and established education journals in existence, by the way. It's not a small journal, not a small deal. They explain exactly that, they say in fact, speaking of sales pitches and things like that, they say explicitly that they sell intentionally as a market strategy, marketing strategy, I should say, Drag Queen Story Hour as being uh, something that raises empathy for LGBT people. But in fact, it's there to justify the performer's sense of self-expression so that the students might become curious about it through a generative model and become interested in living queerly. That's, they put living queerly in italics every time in the paper that they mention that being the real goal. And that they intentionally, strategically pretend that it's about raising empathy for LGBT kids so that they can get their narcissistic butts in the seat. But that's exactly what Paulo Freire says is banking model of education, the teacher justifies his existence by being the person who knows in front of the absolutely ignorant fools that come to his class, has a real high opinion of his students. 
The other thing that he does with his dialogical model, in fact, he uses this to justify and to, to be able to engage in what he calls the generative themes approach to education. So generative themes are the heart and soul of what Freire does. See, the reason we're engaging in dialogue, so if this was a generative situation or if this was a uh, Freirean class, I'd engage, the first couple of lecture series, you come to the lecture series, you come to the workshop, the first couple, we'd all just sit here and talk. And what I'm doing is I'm talking to you and trying to find out what it is that bothers you in your life, where you feel cheated, where you feel oppressed, where you feel you know, unable to speak up, where you're induced, in his words, into a culture of silence, where you feel like you're held back, where you're just angry that things aren't going the way you want. And then what I do is I feed you those ideas back as the basis for the lessons that I'm going to do. So the point of the dialogue is not just to democratize the classroom, but also to data mine the student body, so that you can find out what will be emotionally and politically engaging for them, so that you can frame your lectures, your lessons, I should say not lectures, in terms of things that are going to be emotionally and politically engaging. And by engaging, I mean aggravating, triggering, radicalizing. That's what you're looking for. So the dialogical method he replaces the banking method with is largely based in a, a goal of context discovery. What is the context of the learner. What is their life like? Where are they miserable? Where do they suffer? Why are they angry? Why are they aggrieved? What is emotionally resonant to them? What is politically relevant? How can we use that to unveil their real political uh, conditions? Because the goal is to use the political education to increase engagement, and when you're more engaged, then I can foist the learning on you. I can give you the reading lesson or whatever. In the modern era, this isn't just gonna take place. This data mining doesn't just take place by means of dialogue, it also takes place directly with massive surveying of students, relentless surveying of students, and appropriate surveying of students, on the one hand, asking them questions repeatedly, like it, repeatedly throughout a school year. Take 12 year olds. How often do you think of suicide? What's it like to go through your body changing right now? Hey, girls, are you uncomfortable with the idea that you know, you're growing breasts and boys are looking at you or whatever? How does it make you feel? Let's share. Let's have a dialogue about that. Relentless surveying, what's your emotional state? How much money do your parents make? What kind of, who do they vote for? What kinds of things are happening? Check out what your kids are doing at school. They're filling out a lot of surveys. There are reasons for this. This has been mandated from on high that there will be lots and lots and lots of surveys. You can blame people like Linda Darling Hammond for that. She knew what she was doing. She is instrumental in why there's so much surveying, because we have to have accountability, and in order to have the accountability at the federal level or the state level, but federal in particular, you've gotta find out what they're doing. So you survey them relentlessly, survey after survey after survey after survey. So you can data mine them that way. In the future, we'll find out in the uh, lecture on social emotional learning, this can also, and not even in the future, in the present, they also are using other data mining and tracking tools. They have their little iPad, the little camera on the iPad can track their eyes to see what they're paying attention to. I just found out in Florida the other day that in one of the more conservative, if not the most conservative county in Florida, they're experimenting with a program called HeartMath, where they hook up the kids to heart monitors to find out what their stress levels look like while they're going through the mathematics lessons to find out what is causing them problems. So wearable technology, eye tracking technology, psychometric technology is all being, being employed in order to assess the psychological and emotional state of the children as they go through their learning process. Meanwhile, Panorama or somebody's collecting this data and selling it probably to the intelligence community and Google. Probably not for your kid's own good. Not to help them get five points higher score on their math test because it stresses them out when you do fractions and you wouldn't have known that without hooking them up to a heart monitor. So literally, I mean, there are projections. I'll read about them later in the social emotional learning uh, lecture, but there are literal projections and intentions to bring wearable tech and uh, AI driven apps to further data mine the students. The goal is to find things that are emotionally and politically relevant. You're looking for triggers. Trigger warning, you're looking for triggers. The goal is to give them a political education, which means you've got to find out what 
radicalizes them in terms of politics, what stresses them out in terms of politics, under the guise of saying you're trying to find out where you're stressing them out in terms of learning. Where do they get hung up? Why does math stress them out? And there's a little tiny like nugget of legitimacy to that, but meanwhile, you're also going to bring up topics that are socially and emotionally relevant under social emotional learning, and you're gonna find out where those triggers are. You're gonna ask them questions about sexuality, sex, gender, race, all these politically active topics, school shootings, you're gonna talk about these things all the time and you're gonna find out when and why and how they get stressed and you're gonna frame the lessons in terms of those things. And you know, I just retweeted, I think three or four of these things today from the various uh, kind of expose accounts, whistleblowing accounts dedicated to that project on Twitter, where there's classrooms where it's like, welcome to miss so-and-so's kindergarten. And it's like a bunch of crap about race and a bunch of crap about sexuality written on like the little board. And I would look at it and I was like, it's kind of, maybe that's fake because kindergartners can't read. And then I thought, well, high schoolers can't read either anymore. And that's the reason, because what actually Farian education provides is learning loss, because you're doing this political education instead of doing um, actual education. The thing is about this generative method, it's not hard to understand what it is. The goal is for me to interview you in one way or another as the, as the facilitator, as the, as the educator, as the groomer, and I'm, my goal is to find out what's going to radicalize you and then to shape all of the educational lessons around feeding that back to you so that we can have a political discussion and guide you to the answers I want you to have. And that's what the rest of his method works out to be. But it's extremely hard to call this out because it's not as simple as them having a class on CRT or a class on queer theory. It's that they're tucking in the themes. They're using, I should say, themes to tuck in the ideas of those theories, to do critical race theory analysis on a book, or on a subject, on something that happened. And what they need is to find out what those things are so that those things will come up and then they have the dialogue. So it's not actually necessarily the materials that they're presenting at all, these sexualized books notwithstanding, drag queens notwithstanding. It's not the necessarily the materials at all that are egregious. What is egregious is what they're doing on the back of those materials, which makes it extremely hard because they'll put you on the spot and say, point out what's wrong. And guess what? You weren't in the class to hear how the dialogue went. You're going off of the report of your kid. And that, however that worked out, you know, I've interviewed my kids when they were kids, you know, eight years old. They're not, not terribly descriptive about what actually happened. And that's all you've got in terms of how the dialogue went that followed the perfectly normal looking book that, you know, like you seem to be reading a lot of these, but why are you reading? Okay, but yeah, okay. That's the, that's the mold they want you to be stuck in. It's impossible to call it out because it doesn't look like they're doing anything wrong, but it's that they're using this method the Ferrarian method that's wrong and the, starts with generative themes. So anywhere you see generative themes, you can tell that what they're doing is looking for politically radicalizing material that they can then uh, package back up and feed to your kid. That's the decolonized curriculum that we've mentioned a few times now. So how do they package it back up? They call, Freire calls this process, and I, here come big words, codification and decodification. You actually will see this occasionally in the education literature. Your kid's third grade teacher probably is not going to talk about codifications and decodifications. It sounds hard, but it's to make it into a code and then to take the code away. It's really not that hard of a concept. The idea of codification is that you take whatever I learned. So I might interview you guys, we'll say it's old school for area. I'm gonna to talk to you for a few lectures instead of we're just gonna have a dialogue and I find out that you're really pissed off about inflation. And so I say that the, the first lecture is about reading, we're gonna teach you to read. And so the first word we're gonna to learn to read is inflation. That's literally his program. In fact, for Freire, for reasons that might be magical and I don't actually understand what they are, he decided the right number of generative words to collect is 17. That seems a little arbitrary to me. Maybe there's a deeper reason for it, I don't know. But what you would do is then you would say, a very famous example he gives many times is that you collect the word in Portuguese favela, which means slum from people who live in slums. And then what you would do is you'd present on a slideshow a drawing of a slum. And then what you have them do is look at the slum. Now it's something abstract. It's a drawing. It's not their life. It's not when they go home. It's not where they live. It's an abstract drawing of crappy living conditions. And you have them start looking at it because they can now step away and have what he calls critical distance from the existential circumstance contained within the abstracted, codified theme presented back to them. So you find a politically radicalizing trigger you make it abstract enough not to be radicalizing, then you feed it back to them. And you have what seems to be a generic educational discussion about what they see 
And the goal in a Frarian literacy lesson would be they see a picture of the slum and then you add in the word for slum, which is favela in Portuguese. And so they sight read the word along with the image, haha, they're learning to read. That set of letters corresponds to that image. Doesn't, it's not the best way to learn to read. But it, as it turns out, that's how he decided to do it. The next step, though, is not just to stay with the codification, it's, and it's not to start learning to read off of the codification. It is to decodify, because the political literacy is more important than the actual literacy. The political literacy, in theory, generates the engagement that will make them want to learn to read, and you haven't got there yet. So you have to decodify first. You have to take the codification, the abstractness away from this. This is an abstract thing. You have to take the abstractness away from it now. You have to make it more real, but you have to make them understand what the context represents, the real context. So the first step of decodification has three steps, is reading. <laughs> How funny. You're learning to read the situation, or as the drag queens say in their paper over and over again, learning to read the room, learning to read others' looks. They're very explicit about this. You're learning to read the political content of the situation. So you look at a picture of a slum, and you're learning to read the political content contained in the slum. And the teacher, as a facilitator of this process, is going to guide you to believe that that didn't just happen. It's the, pro it's the product of a process that has created the slum. There's a political process. Some guy in Washington didn't do it right, so now there's a slum. Some guy in, uh, you know, wherever, didn't do it. They wanted to keep people down. They want to get people like you out of the way. So you teach them to read the political ramifications of the existence of the slum. And then you go through and say, well, how does that ruin life? How does it feel to have been a slave? What would it have felt like to live under Jim Crow? How do you think it felt to be a gay at Stonewall? What do you think it would have been like to be one of those kids whose parents disowned them for being gay and kicked them out of the house? What do you think that would feel like? What do you think that would feel like? That's the more modern lesson. That's problematizing. You've heard that word a lot in the last five years. Paulo Freire can be blamed for popularizing it because the second stage of decodification is problematizing. That's the actual Marxist indoctrination. You're not just learning to read in a Marxist perspective, you're now learning to understand the circumstances you see in the picture, the codified picture, in terms of the Marxist view of why that exists and why it's a problem and what makes it a problem. And what makes it a problem is, in the shortest possible expression, something that's somebody else's fault. And in fact, not somebody else in specific, like Gavin Newsom, but the whole system. The system has failed you. Apparently, one of the leaders of the Open Society Foundation in their American office in New York got monkeypox. He wrote a very graphic article that I laughed all the way through about this experience because he begins with saying that the system failed him by not making the vaccines available enough. And then he tells in very great detail how wonderful the experience was. And it was so hard to stop laughing while I read that. <laughs> but it was the system that failed him. That's the point. That's what problematization is about. It's that somewhere the system is the problem. It's not some individual. You can replace an individual. It's the system. We need complete system change. We need a revolution. The system has failed you. You're not marginalized because you're marginalized. You're marginalized because there's a marginalizer. And the marginalizer has set up a system that maintains marginalization. That's the logic. That's problematization. That's understanding the real concrete uh, circumstances of your life, your existential experience or existential situation, as Freire phrases it. And then the third stage of decodification is what I term re-identification. You are to see yourself. By the way, that slum that we just learned to read politically, we learned to read problematically, that's where you live. When you go home tonight, that's where you're going. The reason I know that is because I got that image from talking to you in the first place. So maybe you're, it's inflation, and I'm going to get you all worked up about gas prices. And as you drive home, you're going to see the gas station, you're going to freak out, you're going to get stressed out, and you're going to be like, Somebody caused this. The whole system is corrupt. That's the idea. As opposed to, you know, we kind of know who caused that. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. It's not Putin. <laughs> so as a little aside, since we like to get deep, and everybody likes hard lectures, 
All he's doing here is repackaging something. There are no new ideas in Marxism. It's just a lot of new fluff. He's just repackaging, literally, we go back to 1807 with the phenomenology of spirit. Remember, his PhD is in phenomenology. Although he studied Husserl instead of Hegel, but you don't really get around these things. That's beside the point. Hegel's phenomenology of spirit repackages the dialectic, which is the same dialectic as dialectical materialism that Marx says runs the whole world. Hegel was, in a sense, his grand teacher, if you will, Marx's grand teacher. And what he framed it as is that you are presented with an abstract idea that you then present with its negative, which you find in the world, so that you can create a synthetic, concrete understanding of what you're looking at. And this is all this generative theme codification. There's your abstract, problematization, there's your negative, re-identification, there's your concrete. It's just a repackaging of the dialectical engine of the left all the way back to 1807. Nothing creative here. But the point Ferry tells us is after this, learning will be desired. People will engage vigorously and excitedly in learning. And he holds up the fact that whatever he was doing in the 1963-4 time in Brazil apparently got people to learn to read in 40 some odd days like it's a miracle. And so apparently, maybe it can work. Maybe it's context dependent. I'm finding the research on social emotional learning, for example, says that it does work in certain contexts when presented in certain ways and basically never else. And so it works, you know, 2% of the time for 2% of the people or something. And so, see, it works. We should do it for everybody, full blast with billions of dollars behind it and throw out everything else. Um, a good side example of this, by the way, is that sight reading thing is kind of how they teach dyslexics to read, and it doesn't work for normal kids who need to learn phonics. And so if you talk to your kids about how they're being taught to read in many schools across America, they're actually using the method that the dyslexics use. But of course, that's because you don't want to, first of all, they're hedging toward Freire, but second of all, it's because you don't want to leave the dyslexics out and everybody can learn to read from that method. And so everybody gets the super inclusive dyslexic um, method that doesn't work for 90 something percent of children. The goal though, in advance of making them want to read through this political engagement is to raise political literacy, to conscientize, which is to say radicalize, and to urge them to want to overthrow their society, not just in a revolution, but in a permanent and perpetual cultural revolution modeled after Che Guevara. So education gets replaced. The theft of education we talked about, it gets replaced with conscientization. Another frame, another phrase I would use for conscientization is thought reform. Uh, thought reform is the psychological euphemism given by Robert J. Lifton to what is actually originally pronounced brainwashing, um, literally in the Chinese, xi now, which means wash brain, um, which is what he was analyzing when he was studying the thought reform prisons of China that he called thought reform instead of brainwashing prisons. They literally called it that. The goal is to get the world, to get you, get the learner to see the world through the perspective in solidarity with the oppressed. In other words, to conscientize them into Marxist activism. So this is a Marxification of the purpose of education. It is now to make Marxists. It is to make Marxist activists, not just theorists, but people who understand the world and the need to take action to transform the world. We'll get back to how he Marxified education as a concept itself later, but this is the nuts and bolts of what he's created. Education has been hollowed out and it has been replaced with political education, which is the conscientization or the Marxist programming or reprogramming. It depends on the context, which thing you want to call it. Brainwashing. It looks like education on the outside. It's happening in a school. They talk about math, but maybe what they do is they give you a statistics lesson that's all about racial statistics and crime or all about gay statistics and disease. And it talks about how people were mistreated, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a political lesson dressed up as a math lesson or a political lesson dressed up as a reading lesson. You're gonna to learn to read through the word slum, through the word inflation, through the word misery, through the word suffering, through the word suicide. How many times have you thought about suicide in the past two months? You're 12. Let's just bring that word up a bunch of times so you're more curious about it. Wait, that's possible? That's a thing people can do? I hadn't thought of it until it was generative in my mind. All this did, all we talk about culturally relevant teaching, all they did was update this into race. Take out the old Marxism, out with the critical Marxism, in with the critical race theory. That's it. Same thing. If you take Political literacy in the cultural identity politics frame, you get cultural competence. That's the center, literally goal number two of culturally relevant teaching. The goal in all cases is explicitly raising critical consciousness, in other words, conscientizing. Now, does it work? Is Freire right? Does it create engagement 
that makes for massive interest in learning to read or learn? Well, no. But yes, the political learning part's really effective as it turns out. Turns out brainwashing works. Political radicalization works. Turns out getting people to want to learn to read because they're so radicalized does not work. What does it lead to? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Lost interest, not just in learning to read, but in the relevance of reading at all. The relevance of learning anything at all. Why are we learning when kids are getting shot? Let's go to the state house. How can I learn in a school where it could be my school? Let's go lay on the state house steps and do a bit of performance art to try to get a political agenda pushed through. So it turns out they did an experiment with this. They did an experiment with Frarian education in a number of different uh, schools. They got people to use this method in Nigeria, and they wrote a paper about it in 2007. It was published in a German um, journal, so I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it. And in fact, I didn't even write down what the journal's called in my notes because I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it because you can't make compound words like that and expect Americans to read them. <laughs> I can give anybody that wants it the link. I have actually referred to it in a podcast that I've recorded recently and the link will be available. I'm probably gonna go through the paper itself as a podcast. So the link is accessible. I will give it to anybody who wants it. Just will let me know. I'll put it in the show notes if this is on the YouTubes or whatever. I'm gonna to read to you the stage one, stage two, stage three that they give in the paper for the Frarian method that they employed in their experiment. Stage one was generative theme collection. Stage two is selection of words from the discovered vocabulary. And stage three is the actual process of literacy training. See, we're gonna go right to learning. So stage two is the codification and decodification part. Stage one is the generative themes. I'm gonna to read to you from the paper their description in Nigeria of what happened in the early 2000s when they tried to implement this. I'm not gonna read the generative words part um, because they repeat the generative words that they found, all 17 of them, as it turns out, in stage two. This is what happened in Nigeria when they applied it. This is a direct quote from this paper. From the discussions of the learners, the generative words written by the team of facilitators were resources, money, abundance, crude oil, stealing, pocket, begging, plenty, poverty, suffering, frustration, crying, hunger, crisis, dying, death. Remember, this is, they're going to teach them to read with those words. See Dick Run? No, not so much. <laughs> suffering, frustration, these are adult learners. Adults, adult learners. So these are adults. These words were later depicted in pictorial form. Again, I'm not exaggerating or making up the method. It's so crackpot you think he's gotta be kidding. No, these, pic these words were later depicted in pictorial form, showing the concrete realities and situations in the lives of the people. The pictorial display provoked an emotional state of pity and anger among the discussants. Some of them could not talk, while most of them were moved to tears, asking the question, why, 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 why? Sounds like it's working great. Stage three, the actual process of literacy training. So now they're so motivated, they're engaged. Why, why is my life like this? I'm gonna to learn to read so I can understand more, right? After the completion of stage two, it came as a great surprise to the facilitators. They were shocked that the discussants were not willing to participate in the literacy teaching and training process. They were in a state of emotional wreck. They were furious, angry, shouting, and restless. They were shouting, change, change, change. They were campaigning for Obama, it doesn't say that. But... <laughs> Cursing furiously those who have in one way or the other contributed to the suffering of the people. The bottom line, acquisition of basic literacy skills did not make any meaning to them, and in fact was irrelevant, with some of them turning on and asking the facilitators, what have you people who are learned done to change the situation? Rather, you have worsened the situation when you yourself get to the position. So the students didn't want to learn to read. They were emotional wrecks. They yelled and screamed. They cried. They lost the ability to even talk about it. They were furious. 
They turned on the teachers themselves and said, you're the problem. That happened in China too when they did this. In fact, they killed their teachers. They were so furious with them, they dragged them out into the street and killed them or humiliated them or beat them and made them wear dunce caps, made them apologize in public struggle sessions. So does the Frarian method work? Not to learn to read. So why is it then that we have kids in Providence, Rhode Island, rolling out by the hundreds to lay on the state house steps after a school shooting, 6% of whom can do mathematics at grade level and 14% of whom can read at grade level because reading and math are not relevant to their lives, which is constant political agitation and activism because the Ferrarian method is designed to constantly aggravate them, agitate them, and politically activate them so that they will show up and do that illiterate, innumerate, and that's what they're doing in your schools to your kids. This is why I said they have stolen your kids' education from you. You've paid your taxes, you've done your work, you've gone to your job, you've done what you're supposed to, you trusted the schools, and they, the Marxists literally stole the educational content out to turn them into activists, literally know-nothing activists. And the way that it happened is that Paulo Freire came up with the method that allows it to happen. Your kids go to Paulo Freire schools, which means their education has been stolen from them, which means the high priority is every bit of Freirean education needs to be ripped out of American schools yesterday because it never should have been there in the first place. Any reasonable person looking at this in 1986 or seven or whatever would have said no, but they got a bunch of Marxists put into positions to implement it, to say that it was good, to pump it up, and that's what we have to deal with. That's how education was stolen and replaced with something, conscientization, that has his purposes attached. And his purpose was explicitly to train people to see the world in a particular way that will lead them to want to engage in perpetual cultural revolution. Why did he do it? Well, he was a Marxist. But I think he kind of actually believed that this is what you have to do to overcome oppression. Many people have fallen into this trap. But I should note before we carry on about the whys and whatnot, Ferry actually knew it doesn't work. Sort of. He's in denial, as they say. In the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he actually is in page 30-something, if I recall, in the 20th anniversary or 30th anniversary edition, whichever one I have. He actually has this long discussion where he talks about whether or not the process in Portuguese conscientization, he writes, it's only in Portuguese and in Pedagogy of the Oppressed for some reason, they don't translate it as conscientization, it's conscientes a chow in Portuguese. The group was debating, he's describing a group of people that were going through the method, and the group was debating whether or not the conscientes a chow process of men and women to a specific situation that they're being confronted with through generative methods uh, of injustice might not lead them to, quote, destructive fanaticism and or to a sensation of the total collapse of the world or maybe it being an emotional wreck, right? And he spends, I would quote it for you, but he literally, it's dragged out over like three or four pages as to why, no, 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 it's not us who's wrong. They're just not getting it right. It does not really run into that because we talked to this, he, I mean, the real thing he does is it doesn't really leave that because we talked to this one peasant and he said it was great. He's in denial, but he knows. He spends pages in his 1968 original draft writing that it's already recognized that his method. He only deployed it for the first time in 1964. It's already a massive criticism to where he felt like he had to include it in his magnum opus at pages long, which is, it's not that long of a book. It's like 170 or 80 pages. It's not that long of a book. He spent three or four pages explaining why, no, 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 it doesn't actually lead to dangerous fanaticism, even though people have clearly been pointing out to him that it does. They knew it didn't work. That was in this book, which means in 1985, when we finally get to the point where it starts to creep its way into America, it was in the book they turned to that this might be a problem, and we still adopted it whole hog in less than 10 years. Our education departments thought this was a brilliant idea. The colleges of education, if you wanna, you wanna blame somebody, you blame the colleges of education. The who is Colleges of Education, Henry Giroux. I don't have names for you. I don't have names for you, Henry Giroux. So why did he do this, knowing that it doesn't really work? Because he was doing a Marxist religious revival. He's a religious fanatic. He was in the religion of Marxism. 
He has to transform the world. That's the religious duty of Marxists. He has to use learners to get, he has to get more people to transform the world with him because you can only transform the world from a position of the oppressed in solidarity as a class, an awakened conscious class that will engage in the kind of activity that allows them to seize the means of production of society, man, and the world. That's why he's a religious figure. He's doing a revival on a religion that we've refused for a century and a half to recognize as a religion. And he realized that embedding it within education was going to be extremely successful. And he's very explicit in the politics of education, by which time he had definitely read Gramsci, that it should be embedded not just in secular education, but also in religious instruction. The entire 10th chapter of the politics of education is actually about embedding it in the church. He has what is described in that book as a permanent prophetic vision for education in a revolutionary society. He is explicitly, repeatedly utopian. The word utopian appears in the book something close to 100 times. He's explicit that that's the only right thing to do, that the left is intrinsically utopian when it's truly the left. The right cannot possibly be utopian by definition, et cetera, et cetera. And to do this, he actually the, the, how did he pull it off as he actually Marxified education? To understand that this guy's a religious nut job that created a Marxist of education requires us to take a step back into the theology of Marxism again. We've got to understand Marxism and understand that what we're looking at is a religious revival in Marxism. So let me read to you from Giroux's foreword to the politics of education. Henry Giroux wrote these words. He was given the privilege of writing the one of the introductions to the book and um, give you exactly what Giroux wrote. Within the, discourse of, uh, sorry, within the discourse of theologies of liberation, Freire fashions a powerful theoretical antidote to the cynicism and despair of many left radical critics. So that's the problem of reproduction being overcome. The utopian character of his analysis is concrete in its nature and appeal, and it takes as its starting point collective actors in their various historical settings and the, the particularity of their problems and forms of oppression. It is utopian only in the sense that it refuses to surrender to the risks and dangers that face all challenges to dominant power structures. It is prophetic in that it, let me draw your attention to this sentence. It is prophetic in that it views the kingdom of God as something to be created on earth, but only through a faith in both other human beings and the necessity of permanent struggle. The notion of faith that emerges in Freire's work is informed by the memory of the oppressed, the suffering that must not be allowed to continue, and the need to never forget that the prophetic vision is an ongoing process, a vital aspect of the very nature of human life. In short, by combining the discourses of critique and possibility, Freire joins history and theology in order to provide the theoretical basis for a radical pedagogy that combines hope critical reflection, and collective struggle. I want you to go back in your mind and imagine you're a dean of a college of education in 1986 or so, and this book comes across your desk, and the claim is that we need to revamp the department in terms of this. That's what it says. That's the introduction to the book. I'm thinking you're going to read that first before you make a decision on the book. And then you're saying, yes, build the kingdom of God on earth, because it's prophetic in that way, but only through a faith in both other human beings and the necessity of permanent struggle. And you say, yes. So I told you the 10th chapter is all about religion. So how explicit is Freire's religion in what he's viewing and what he's bringing? Why is he doing this? Why generative themes? Why codification and all this abstract BS? that's obviously stealing education from your kids. We have to talk about Easter. In chapter eight of this stunning volume, The Politics of Education, he says, at the very moment when she or he begins the process, the educator must be prepared to die as the exclusive educator of the learners. She or he cannot be an educator for freedom if she or he only substitutes the content of another educational practice for a bourgeois practice and thus preserves the form of that practice. In essence, the educator has to live the profound meaning of Easter. Easter. Any Christians? Anybody know what that means? 
He goes on in chapter 10 at length on this. This new apprenticeship will violently break down the elitist concept of existence they had absorbed while being ideologized. The sine qua non of the apprenticeship, that the apprenticeship demands is that first of all, they really experience their own Easter, that they die as elitists so as to be resurrected on the side of the oppressed, the pedagogy of the oppressed folks, that they be born again with the beings who are not allowed to be, such a process implies a renunciation of myths that are dear to them. The myth of their superiority, of the purity of their soul, of their virtues, their wisdom, the myth that they save the poor, the myth of the neutrality of the church, of theology, of education, of science, technology, the myth of their own impartiality. From these grow the other myths of the inferiority of other people, of their spiritual and physical impurity, and of the absolute ignorance of the oppressed. This Easter, which results in the changing of consciousness, in case you wonder what conscientization is about, it is an Easter. It is a death and resurrection on the side of the oppressed. He just said that. This Easter, which results in the changing of consciousness, must be existentially experienced in order to be an educator. The real Easter is not commemorative rhetoric. If you're a Christian, that means what you celebrate in March or April. It's praxis. It is historical involvement. The old Easter of rhetoric is dead with no hope of resurrection. Sorry, Christians. It is only in the authenticity of historical praxis that Easter becomes the death that makes life possible. But the bourgeois worldview, basic, basically necrophiliac, that means death-loving, and therefore static, is unable to accept the supremely biophiliac, that is life-loving, experience of Easter. The bourgeois mentality, which is far more than just a convenient abstraction, kills the profound historical dynamism of Easter and turns it into no more than a date on the calendar. That's Paulo Freire. Why is he doing this? Because he's a religious cult nut job. The end. That's why. That's it. He sees Marxism as a religion to transform the world and the people in it into what they were always supposed to be, to build the kingdom of God on earth in solidarity with the oppressed who have the only capacity to actually understand what oppression is and how oppression needs to be transformed. How, through relentless critique of all that is, denounce, 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 denounce. And if you do it from a position of conscientization, you automatically announce the next chapter in the unfolding process toward utopia. To do this, you must yourself experience the Easter. You must die and be reborn as a Marxist. Since God in Marxism is man himself, you have to become your own Jesus. So we're dealing with a religion here. We're not dealing with education here. Not even close. Not even close. This is a theology. I want to remind you, because I think I mentioned it in the last lecture, maybe I said it so many times in the last few days, that I thought I did, and I didn't, but I'm going to say it again anyway, of Ben Clement's definition of religion for First Amendment purposes. Ben Clements wrote a law review article in the 90s. I don't have the title of it, but we can find that. I forgot to write that down. And he wrote this law review and gives a definition of religion for First Amendment Establishment Clause purposes. It has a very simple definition. Is it a system of belief and practice? that gives a concept of man in the world, or of the world and man's role in it, really, that such that it gives rise to duties of conscience. Behaviors you have to take up to be a good person. Yes, yes, and yes, obviously. So we talked briefly before about how Marxism views the world. It has a concept of the world. The world is a place that is uh, transforming dialectically, and it has intelligent beings called humans in it that are able to work out the contradictions to move the dialectic along. Your duty as a person is to move the dialectic along and humanize the world, to make the world more fit for humans, and in the process to recognize yourself in the humanization process as a creator who creates things. You envision it in your mind, you create it in the world, you see yourself the subject creates the object, you come to realize that you are a creative subject who creates the object, so you come to understand yourself as he who creates. That's your essential true nature. We are also more uh, able to create and create well and to take care of one another when we do so collectively. So it's a collectivist creative 
process. And so man has forgotten through the division of labor that he is actually a collective species being. He is a being that lives for his entire species. And therefore, we have forgotten that we actually are communists. And so what we are to do is engage in this work to bring things into the world, to see that we are creators, and to see that we are truly creative only when we are creative together. It has a view of the world, it has a view of man, a concept of man in the world. It is a system of belief about how the world works, and it's filled with activist practice. You have to teach this stuff, you have to radicalize people, and you have to go lay on the state house steps. You have to be active in the world. You must do the praxis. You must be Henry Giroux getting hundreds of Marxists tenured to colleges of education, so he'll accept this crazy pants book when it comes up. In other words, critical pedagogy or Marxism in general, especially post Freire, satisfies the definition that the, first, uh, that the Supreme Court recognizes for a First Amendment Establishment Clause violation it has no place in our schools legally, not just morally and ethically. It has no place in American schools. It is a religious instruction. Let them make their private schools and see who wants to go to them. It violates the Establishment Clause. The only people who are gonna to wanna to go to them are ones who are trying to get their kids into super woke elite colleges, and that's the only way you'll get into those, but nobody wants to be woke, so they'll discredit themselves, and Harvard will become the clown college that it really is, and it'll be fabulous. <laughs> but am I so certain that they really have a concept of man in the world? Well, let's see what Friday says about it. I mean, I could read to you from Marx, we won't drag this out, but let's read from Paulo Freire. This is also in, uh, this is in the sixth chapter of Politics of Education. Experience teaches us not to assume that the obvious is clearly understood. So it is with the truism with which we begin. All educational practice implies a theoretical stance on the, education, on the educa educator's part. This stance in, turns in, in turn implies, sometimes more and sometimes less explicitly, an interpretation of man in the world. It could not be otherwise. The process of man's orientation to the world involves not just the association of sense images as for animals, it involves above all thought language. That is the possibility of the act of knowing through his praxis by which man transforms reality. Man is the transformer of reality. For man, this process of orientation to the world can be understood neither as a purely subjective event nor as an objective or mechanistic one but only as an event in which subjectivity and objectivity are united. We're not going full into Marxism and Hegelianism as a theology, but that's literally the point of the Hegelian theology, is that the subject and object have been estranged from one another and have to be brought back together to make the absolute, which is his name for the deity. So that's some context for you there. Orientation in the world so understood places the question of the purposes of action at the level of critical perception of reality. Oh look, duties of conscience that you have to engage in from a spiritual perspective. If for animals, orientation in the world means adaptation to the world for man, it means humanizing the world by transforming it. For animals, there is no historical sense, no options or values in their orientation in the world. For man, there is both a historical and a value dimension. Men have the sense of project in contrast to the extinctive routines of animals. He goes on in the next paragraph to say that he'll go ahead and now prove this even though it's self-evident that men are the people who transform the world into what it should be through the dialectical process outlined by Karl Marx on the back of George Hegel. He says that what your point, the point of education in relation to this is, speaking of religious sounding things, he says this repeatedly throughout the book, is to learn to speak the word to proclaim the world, which is sort of biblical. So what the theft of education enables and the Marxification of education enables is transforming school into Marxist Sunday school for 35 hours a week. It's a religion, has no place there. He calls this, because he's a Marxist and he's a Marxist religious nut job, humanistic education. That's the title of the ninth chapter of this book. He also calls it education for liberation or education for freedom. He refers to it as gaining political literacy, which he says is a higher right, a more true human right than gaining literacy. Now we have to understand that what did Marx mean by humanization to really understand that humanization is a uh, Marxist concept and that's what I told you earlier. You have to transform, man is estranged from his true nature, he doesn't know that he's fully human because if he was fully human he'd be a communist and therefore you have to transform man at his level of understanding or if we quote from Herbert Marcuse at the, and I literally mean it, he says at the biological level, 
to need socialism, to need communism, to realize that he transcends private property and lives one for another and shouldn't have to work, but should want to work in order to bring his vision into the world and see himself as the creative being. Meanwhile, he's transforming the world to be fit for man. The world as it is is too wild. It's not refined. It hasn't been humanized. It hasn't been turned into things like chairs and tables, laptops. It has to be humanized, made fit for man. We're a higher level being. We're not mere animals. You can hear their existential scream when they write about this. They cast down God, have an existential scream. We're not just animals. We're not just animals. You have to be made to be aware of what it means to be human by doing work or by doing the work. That's why it's a hammer and sickle on the flag. That's a religious symbol. You have to figure out how to get to unestranged labor. You have to transcend, Marx says in the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, that we have to aim for true communism, not crude communism. Crude communism means hating capitalism. True communism means the full transcendence of private property and thus the transcendence of human estrangement from himself. Human self-estrangement by the division of labor has to be overcome. The belief in the Marxist religion is that man makes society through his praxis. Friday just said that. But then in turn, the society that you live in makes you through social conditioning, which Marx called the inversion of praxis in which the theorists today call socialization. Social emotional learning is a deliberate seizing of the means of socialization. So the children are socialized correctly according to the theory. You have to do the work. That's what sets you free in the Marxist religion. You are to transform yourself, transform society, and transform the world so that they are all fit for each other. And as Henry Giroux reminded us, that we're making the kingdom of God on earth. By the way, transform is a Marxist watchword. If you see it's transformative, transformational, transform this, transform that, Marxist. You go to the United Nations websites, you see they have 17 sustainable goals to transform our world. Hey, wonder what that's about. Marxism. Transform, transform, transform. The term transform in some variation, like I just mentioned, occurs 166 times in the politics of education. It appears 112 times in another book I have that's a collection of Giroux's essays called The Giroux Reader. I tried to find out how many hundreds of times it appears in another book I have by Giroux called On Critical Education, but my PDF's weird. So it's somewhere around 100 times in that book. Um, for some reason, there are shadow, when I keyword search, there are shadow hits that don't exist. It's extra paragraphs, like repeat paragraphs, so it doesn't work. Around a hundred times. The word transform appears in their literature over and over and over again. You read the economic and philosophic manuscripts, I didn't keyword search it hundreds of times, every page. Transform, transform, transform. So what Paulo Freire believes is that man has been estranged from himself because he doesn't know that he's a knower. That's what we heard. You're an absolute ignorant. That's what the education system does. And now we're going to see how he started to Marxify education. He thinks that men have been estranged from themselves as knowers. You've been estranged from yourself as a conscious knower and a creative subject, somebody who can transform the world and knows that they can transform the world. As that is, that you don't you don't know that you're your true nature, which is a Marxist creator. For men, he says, as beings of pra beings of praxis to transform the world is to humanize it, even if making the world human may not yet signify the humanization of men. It may simply mean impregnating the world with man's curious and inventive presence, imprinting it with the trace of his works. The process of transforming the world, which reveals this presence of man, can lead to his humanization as well as his dehumanization, to his growth or his diminution. These alternatives reveal to man his problematic nature and pose a problem for him, requiring that he choose one path or the other. See, that's a duty of conscience. Often this very process of transformation ensnares man in his freedom to choose. Nevertheless, because they impregnate the world with their reflective presence, only men can humanize or dehumanize. Humanization is their utopia, which they announce in denouncing dehumanizing processes. So the way that you announce the utopia is you find anything you can call dehumanizing and denounce it. I'll give you an example, a very recent podcast I released. I think the most recent podcast I released on the New Discourses platform is reading through an academic paper, I kid you not, titled Cripping Incest Discourse. Cripping means the disability version of queering. They've claimed the word cripple as, or crip as a power word for themselves. Cripping Incest Discourse, so what do we have? Uh, do you denounce the dehumanizing processes? Well, in this paper, they denounce the idea of being against incest because incest produces 
disproportionately large numbers of deformed uh, offspring, and therefore you clearly, if you are against incest, support the idea of a eugenics against disabled people. So you denounce dehumanizing processes like being against incest. Not sure what's going on with that guy's sister. He puts up this humanizing education. I'm not kidding. Go listen to it. It's horrifying. I say the F word a lot in that podcast. <laughs> not because it's in the text. That's all me. He, he compares your options. You have this humanizing education or what he gives is, an, uh, is the opposing view. In the case of dominating education, so that's it. Humanizing or dominating, that's it. Total false choice. The captor of existing knowledge negates the active principle of consciousness. This form of education involves practices by, by which one strives to domesticate consciousness, transforming it, as we have said, into an empty receptacle. Education and cultural action for domination is reduced to a situation in which the educator, as the one who knows, transfers existing knowledge into the learner as the one who does not know. So you're starting to see the stratification, the dichotomy, knowers versus not knowers, or actually people who consider themselves knowers versus people who are not allowed to be considered knowers. And you're about to see a Marxist theory of knowledge in education come out of this. So your choices are, you either educate for humanization by denouncing all dehumanizing practices, which apparently some people thought includes what we just talked about, or you're literally domesticating people like farm animals by educating them and say learning to do math, say through algorithmic processes like long division. What does this lead to? In truth, he says, there is no humanization without liberation, just as there is no liberation without a revolutionary transformation of the class society. For in the class society, all humanization is impossible. There's your Marxism, unambiguous, no question. Liberation becomes concrete only when society is changed, not when its structures are simply modernized. Ah, back to the problem of reproduction. So what the revival that Freire is bringing to education and to Marxism, Marxism is a religion really, through education, the revival he's bringing to the Marxist theology is that we can get around the problem of reproduction. How? By switching out education for political education, literacy for political literacy, domesticating education for humanizing education in his ridiculous Marxist straw man of it. And like I said, this is fundamentally collectivist or it can't be Marxist. Here's how Paulo Freire phrases this, although this is phrased throughout all of Marxist stuff everywhere, but this is particularly clear on the point. This is again in the politics of education. Remember, put in your head that you're in 1986, you work at a college of education and you're saying yes to this book. Since it is always a process, Freire tells us, knowing presumes a dialectical situation. I'm sorry that it's a new word for many of you, but it's really important. Now, knowing presumes a dialectical situation, not strictly an I think, but a we think. It is not the I think that constitutes the we, the we think, but rather the we think that makes it possible for me to think. You can only be somebody who thinks if you think along with everybody else. I think, say therefore I am, is fulfilled in we think, therefore we are which echoes, say, George Lukács, saying that the only correct understanding of somebody, another Marxist, the only correct understanding of somebody is in terms of their class, their class identity, which in the final battle has to be overcome, but not before. That's history and class consciousness for you. This is the Marxification of education. This is the turning of, Marx, uh, of education or knowing into a Marxist theory. It's not just Marxist practice stuck into an educational model. It is a Marxist theory of what it means to know or what it means to be educated. A Marxist theory of education and literacy is what Paulo Freire gives us because his goal is to unestrange man from knowing that he's a knower. There are the people who have designated themselves as knowledgeable. They made themselves teachers. They're, they consider everybody else absolute ignorance. They consider them students and so you are estranged from the idea of knowing by an artificial political process that benefits the people that get to create it. That's a Marxist theory of everything. So what you can do is seize the means of production of that thing, and you have a Marxist theory of praxis. Illiterates, he tells us, know they are concrete men. We're gonna hear that you're alienated from yourself as a knower here. They know that they do things. What they do not know in the culture of silence in which they are ambiguous dual beings is that men's actions as such are transforming, creative and recreative. 
So they know that they do stuff, but they don't know that what they do transforms the world, because that's been hidden from them. They don't know that they're creators, because that's been kept from them. For those of you keeping score at home and know what the words mean, this is Gnosticism. This is the Gnostic heresy all over again. If you don't know what that is, this is the snake in Genesis 3. Overcome by the myths of this culture, including the myth of their own natural inferiority, they do not know that their action upon the world is also transforming. Prevented from having a structural perception, so you have to have the special knowledge, the structural perception in order to transform reality. Prevented from having a structural perception of the facts involving them, they do not know that they cannot have a voice. That is, that they cannot exercise the right to participate consciously in the socio-historical transformation of their society because their work does not belong to them. Marxism, Marxism, Marxism. Most of these words and texts from which they learn, sorry, that's a in media res quote, have nothing to do with the actual experience of illiterate learners. See, this is why you have to use generative words. When there is some relationship between the words and the learner's experience, its expression is so contrived and paternalistic that we don't even dare call it infantile. That's when people try to do cultural, uh, culturally relevant teaching by making kids rap, and then they get criticized for making kids rap as like white kids, and it's super awkward. It's right there. This way of handling illiterates implies a distorted opinion. It is as if illiterates were totally different from everyone else. Alien, one might say. This distortion fails to acknowledge their real life experience, lived experience, other ways of knowing, and all the past and ongoing knowledge acquired through their experience. Phenomenological, I added a syllable, phenomenological uh, knowledge, other ways of knowing. That's where they keep saying other ways of knowing. That's why it's all about other ways of knowing and other knowledges, excluded knowledges, excluded ways of knowing. That's what he's talking about. And it's all rooted what? In lived experience. In their real life experience and all the past and ongoing knowledge acquired through their experience. As passive and docile beings, since this is how they are viewed and treated, right, illiterate learners must continue to receive transfusions this is, of course, an alienating experience and capable of contributing to the process of transformation of reality. This is what he see, sees as education. This is a Marxification of education. Knowledge itself becomes the site of a Marxist analysis. Knowers versus not knowers. In the light of such a concept, unfortunately, all too widespread literacy programs can never be efforts toward freedom. They will never question the very reality that deprives men of the right to speak up. Not only literates, but all those who are treated as objects in, in, in a dependent relationship. These men, illiterate or not, are not in fact marginal. What we said before bears repeating. They are not beings outside of, they are beings for another. Therefore, the solution to their problem is to become not beings inside of, but men freeing themselves. For in reality, they are, those are duties of conscience, by the way. For in reality, they are not marginal to the structure, but oppressed men within it. Alienated men, they cannot overcome their dependency by incorporation into the very structure responsible for the dependency. So you can't teach them to read and write to get a good job because then that would incorporate them into the structure. You can't teach them to succeed and climb out of their bad situation because then they betray the people they left behind. And they contribute to the society that's causing the problem in the first place. You instead have to teach them, radicalize them to believe that the society itself is the problem and that they stay in poverty and solidarity and suffering so that they can come together and overthrow it in total, seizing the means of production. This is a Marxist theory. It says there is no other road to humanization, theirs as well as everyone else's, other than authentic transformation of the dehumanizing structure. Only one way, revolution. Learning to read and write, he says, ought to be an opportunity for men to know what speaking the word really means. Doesn't mean just talking, by the way. A human act implying reflection and action. Marxist praxis, in other words. As such, it is a primordial human right and not the privilege of a few. Speaking the word is not a true act if it is not at the same time associated with the right of self-expression and world expression, of creating and recreating of deciding and choosing and ultimately participating in society's historical process. In the culture of silence, the masses are mute. That is, they are prohibited from creatively taking part in the transformations of their society and therefore pro prohibited from being. They are not human unless they're allowed to transform society politically. This is the Marxist religion. Even if they can occasionally read or write because they were taught in humanitarian but not humanist, 
literacy campaigns, they are nevertheless alienated from the power responsible for their silence. This is what his view of education is. And so he says, because men are historical beings incomplete and conscious of being incomplete, that's man is dialectical and has to transform himself to his completed state, which is a perfect communist. Because men are historical beings incomplete and conscious of being incomplete, revolution is as natural and permanent a human dimension as is education. The point of education is revolution. It is man's natural state to be in perpetual revolution. This is Friday Marxifying education. It happens by redefining literacy as political literacy as we talked about, but let me give you a few comparisons. Let me give you kind of a very quick rundown. What is Marxism? Marxism is a theory that there's a special kind of property. It's called capital. The bourgeois give themselves access to capital and exclude other people from capital by reading the definition of what it actually means to own things in terms of property rights so that they have it and other people don't have it. And then they can accumulate more wealth that way, creating an intrinsic class conflict. They weave an ideology called capitalism that is enforced by structural classism that keeps the upper class up and the lower class down. The proletariat on the bottom, the working class, can be awakened to class consciousness and become revolutionary to seize the means of production and overthrow society, in Marx's words, by abolishing private property. He says in the Communist Manifesto, which by the way, speaking of this being a religion, the original title for the Communist Manifesto until Engels told Marx to change it was the, com the Communist Confession of Faith. Marx was like, this is what I want to call it. Engels was like, bad idea, brah. People are going to figure it out. You have this religion, and he plugged economic conditions in, and that's what you get, what I just described. And that's Marxism as tightly described as you've probably ever heard it. Now imagine that you said instead that the special form of property that certain people give themselves access to is called whiteness. They've established racial categories such that white people give themselves access to whiteness, and they exclude other people called people of color from it. To maintain that, they, why this is justifiable, they establish an ideology called white supremacy. White supremacy structurally determines how society is arranged through something called structural or systemic racism. You can be awakened to this racial consciousness and become an anti-racist who's going to fight against that as an activist. And a, as Robin D'Angelo describes it, lifelong commitment to an ongoing process of self-reflection, self-critique, and social activism. Maybe they can seize the means of cultural production, establish a dictatorship of the anti-racists, exactly like Ibram Kendi described in his right a constitutional amendment to end discrimination in 2019, and they can take over. And now we've heard a Marxist theory of race, which we call race Marxism, which they call critical race theory. Let's say that we have another group of people who decided they were going to call themselves normal they're normal people. We're normal people. We're just trying to be normal. We're not weirdos. We're not abnormal. And so they segregate society into a category of people who are considered normal and a category of people who are abnormal. They give themselves access. Why do you get to go to this thing? Why do you get to have this job? Why do you have to do this? Why didn't you get fired for wearing leather to work? I don't know, because I'm normal. And they stratify society around the concept of normal, but they define what gets to be normal. Other people didn't get to find get to define what's normal, they're abnormal, or as the word goes, queer. And you now have a Marxist theory of sex, gender, sexuality, mental health status, etc., or a Marxist theory of normalcy that's called queer theory, or queer Marxism, or gender ideology, whichever one you like. It's the exact same thing. This is what Marx is. So you have this religion, you plug in, man is determined by his economic circumstances because I want people's money, Karl Marx. And you get Marxism, classical Marxism. You unplug economics, you plug in race, white people created a special form of property called whiteness, blah, 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 and you get CRT. You unplug race, you plug in normalcy, you get queer theory. You unplug any three of any of those three and you plug in what it means to be considered somebody who is educated or who knows or who is literate, and you get Paulo Freire's theory of education. You have certain people who have designated themselves people who know. The thing that they know is called knowledge. Other people don't have access to it. They don't know. They are absolutely ignorant, as we heard. They are absolutely not to be considered knowers. Therefore, they have no political agency because when they show up, they're considered ignorant. Nobody listens to them. Nobody cares about the knowledge that they have through their lived experience. They do things. They know they do things. They've gained experience and nobody listens to it because they don't know because they're not educated. They're not literate. They're not knowers in the modern educational parlance. 
They could, however, seize the means of production of education and create Marxists with it. And then you have Paulo Freire's Marxification of education. All you have to do to get there is define the true meaning of literacy to be political literacy, the true meaning of reading to read the political context of your real life and to understand it therefore in terms of the underlying concept of man in the world that you're importing, which is as good as any other because apparently they always happens. And so in this case, the only legitimate one that's not racist, sexist, classist, et cetera, is Marxism. The only one that doesn't reproduce the existing society that doesn't suffer the problem of reproduction is Marxism. So we're going to have a Marxist political education and all other forms of education are actually illegitimate. Knowers already know. We don't recognize that because we're bigots against illiterate, ignorant people. So they have to be turned into people who already are considered people who know. Or they have to be made to be people who know that they know. In other words, that they know that they know because they've been given a Marxist understanding of their circumstances. You will get them there through presenting the context of their lives through generative themes that you then codify so they can have critical distance, understand it, and then you problematize that and then reconnect them to it personally so that they know that that's who they are and become radicalized. Then they'll want to learn to read for real, apparently almost never. <laughs> This is the Marxification of education. What, Paulo Freire, why can't your kids read? Or maybe your kids can. Why can't the kids in Providence, Rhode Island read? Because Paulo Freire describes the subjects of education, or the, the, the objects of education, what you're learning as a mediator of knowledge, not as knowledge itself. It's a thing that you use like a mirror to reflect upon the political consequences of your life. The content doesn't matter. It's just a mirror. It's a mediator of knowledge. He says it over and over and over again. It's a mediator of generating consciousness. It's a prop. The math lesson is a prop for political learning. The word favela is a prop. Sorry, the word favela, the syllables, it's a prop to learn about what the slum is. You're not learning to read. You're learning to read the political context in a particular way, with educator as facilitator. That's actually how he phrases it. A better word for that would be groomer, but we're not allowed to say that on social media anymore and probably anywhere else. Academic lessons, in other words, don't matter. They are just vehicles for the political literacy or conscientization process. So he creates this Marxist theory of being a knower, transforms education into a conscientization process. He drags in all of these Marxist ideas, all these post-colonialist elements, so that that's the content around which He's actually politicizing, but then he says, throughout all of his books, he says, no, 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 you can't just copy my method. You have to do it in your context. You have to go to Nigeria and talk about oil and poverty and dying and death, whatever is real to them. You have to get with the kids and ask them about if they, commit, if they feel like they want to commit suicide, or if they've ever thought that maybe they're a girl, or like if they ever had sexual feelings, or is it really weird, or how do you feel about this drag queen we dragged into the classroom in front of you as a generative learning opportunity. And everything that's happening to your children at school makes sense now. It's actually not that hard. It's just hard to get rid of it. And it happened because we let it happen. Now, I want to tell you there is a weakness here. There is a weakness here. It turns out that when you have a theory, a Marxist theory of knowing, and thus a Marxist theory of knowledge, what, considered, what is considered a way of knowing, a valid way of knowing, or other ways of knowing or what is a knowledge and what is an excluded knowledge is. Turns out a lot of the things that they call excluded knowledges were excluded from being knowledge for a really good reason. Maybe they're just wrong. Maybe they're superstition. Maybe they're idiotic. Maybe they're literally insane. Maybe they're vulnerable narcissism or grandiose narcissism posing as knowledge like with the drag queen. And so when you now have a theory of a Marxist theory of knowledge that says you can't exclude knowledges, Guess what you have to do? You have to let in the wrong. You have to let in the stupid. You have to let in the crazy. And so their engine is getting filled up with more and more stupid, wrong, and crazy stuff. And eventually, it can't bear the weight of that. The goal for us is to stop the train before it takes a bunch of us out in the process. In medicine, this is already happening. In medical education, this is already happening. In, Soviet, in the Soviet Union, they had Trofim Lysenko, who did it in biology, and they would call this uh, Soviet politicization of scientific knowledge, Lysenkoism, which killed probably between the Soviet Union and China somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 35 million people by starvation, which is not a pleasant way to go. We have medical Lysenkoism because we're teaching woke crap in medical schools. 
It's probably worth thinking about. I estimate that at the present time, I will not suggest anything that might count as medical lysenkoism that's already killed maybe more than a million people. And I'll just look around the room while I don't suggest anything specific in terms of that. I estimate that if we get out of this with fewer than 10 million unnecessary deaths through medical malpractice, I'd be shocked. And that doesn't count the uh, children we're sterilizing uh, with the process of the gender ideology uh, and maybe other things that we're also just gonna look around the room and not mention. So it's a double-edged sword. But it's a dangerous double-edged sword, so our task is to stop it before it causes the mass death it has to cause before and then during and then after its inevitable collapse. For some reason in my notes, I just put in bold here, decolonizing the curriculum again, <laughs> because that's what that really is all about. The end here, I'm just gonna tell you, the Marxification of education, the big theme here is not this religious revival, this bringing back the Marxist religion, that's the theme of what Paulo Freire achieved, but what he enabled is the big theme of the whole series of lectures is the theft of education. Marxifying education enables the theft of education because it enables Marxists who are excluded outsiders to claim that their theory is knowledge. It gives them the opportunity, the open door to seize control of knowledge, learning, pedagogy, the educational process, et cetera, and allows them therefore access to start refocusing the purpose of education out of educating and into conscientizing, into raising consciousness. The next lecture we're gonna start with tomorrow afternoon after a fun Q&A session in the morning is going to be all about this conscientization process that they've hollowed out education to stick in its place. Like I said, I already told you the punchline, what do we do about this nightmare? My goal in this lecture has been actually much more simple than, to, than, than you think. I've only had really two. I want you to be able to recognize the generative method and understand how it works so that you can actually start calling it out where it's taking place in schools. Absolutely critically important. Making sure the funding streams that go to generative methods, making sure that the, the future employment of people employing generative methods, et cetera, are all at severe threat by you taking action to say that this is inappropriate and doesn't belong. And secondly, I want to make it absolutely abundantly clear that we are dealing with an unambiguous, no doubt, no wiggle room violation of the establishment clause in having this in any government run school or agency that involves educating anybody at all. They are actual, if there's a DEI lesson in your say military that does the same thing. It is the exact same process. It's the exact same vision. It's the exact same theory of man in the world. It's the exact same conscientization uh, agenda. It has the exact same violation of the establishment clause. Woke education and training has no place in anything that the federal or state government or local government in the United States of America is doing, thanks to our brilliant founders who wrote the First Amendment and made it clear enough that a five-year-old can understand it. Those two things are the main goals. You need to learn to be able to see it. You need to go think about examples where the, the, the generative themes method is occurring. You need to look for examples in your kid's school. You need to get start working in ways to get articulate about calling this out. No, this is what you're doing with the book. It's not the book itself, it's what you're doing with it. This is how it works, it's not appropriate and you're not doing it to our kids anymore. And then by the way, maybe we'll see you in court because I think by you doing this, that there's an excellent case that you're violating the First Amendment and I would love for the Supreme Court to finally get to adjudicate this because I can give them every single piece of information they need to make sure it falls the right way. It's not even hard. They missed the ball for a century and it's gotta stop. So thank you for coming, listening and learning.